presentations this morning. We have a presentation uh, by our own Judge Parker. Uh, we have Mr. Gary Miller and Mr. Alan Nice, and it is it's called Start, and it's Sobriety for Addiction Recovery Treatment Foundation presentation of their work in supporting Douglas County DUI <coughs> Drug Court and the Accountability Court. With no further ado, please come forward. Uh, you want to kick out the who's kicking out the <coughs> So, <clears throat> just briefly, thank you all um, for allowing us the opportunity. I'm going to speak for just a second. Um, the Douglas County DUI Drug Court has a foundation that supports our program. It's called START. Uh, it is supported by a board of directors. I have two of the individuals here from our board today that, that just want to speak. Uh, a little bit about the program itself, what they've seen in the program, maybe why they support the program, and just provide a little more information to you all uh, about what we do in the accountability court arena. So uh, this is Mr. Allen DeNice and Mr. Gary Miller. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for letting us invite ourselves to your meeting. So, uh, uh, actually, uh, I have no formal presentation per se, just a report back, and I actually want to get feedback from the board members about their awareness of the program and how successful it is. Um, so just back to the beginning, uh, Judge Barker and Judge Detmering called me and say, we want to take you to lunch, and I was like, this is either really good or really bad. <laughs> so. Anyway, uh, we met with Lori and uh, you guys, and uh, basically they said, we need a uh, board of directors immediately. So I was like, glad to help. So good, I'm not in trouble. I'm off that list. So uh, uh, I wasn't aware of what the accountability court uh, did and how successful it is. So a few statistics for you. This program um, is the most successful program of any program out on the market, including AA, anything. I think we've had a 90, we have less than a 4% recidivism rate in this program. So if you think about that, um, that the public would just wish to have that kind of success. So let me just go through a little bit. Um, you see the founding board members. Uh, current board members, we'll review all that. Um, Amy Bailey is here, who is my assistant at work. And quite frankly, um, if you ask anybody, she's the workaholic that does all the work for the board. Thank you. Um, and thanks for recognizing her last month, even though she tried to kill me afterwards and I tricked her into going to the meeting. Um, who's been to a graduation? I will tell you. When you go to that graduation, you understand what this program is about. This program changes lives. And you don't see it until you hear the spouses get up and speak and say, it's nice to have my spouse back. Uh, I heard a lady say that her husband had not been present for 10 years. And he graduated from the program. She got up and spoke and said, this program has changed our family dramatically. So. Uh, Here's some sponsorship and support. Um, Gary's pretty much been our sugar daddy, um, <laughs> uh, as he is with the rest of the community as well. So I uh, appreciate Greystone and uh, actually the Cobank board that, that you were on. <clears throat> See some of the support folks at uh, Lori Bomar always does the food at the graduations. Um, so let, let, let's talk a little bit about the math of the program. And I think a lot of people uh, get focused on the money, but I don't think that's the success of the program. So uh, if you'll go to the accountability courts, improve our community, saves taxpayers money. If you, um, I'm going to jump down. Each participant pays over $3,750 for 18 months in the program. If you take that back to line one, um, I believe the jail subcontracts and allows other municipalities to hire the jail for $1,080 a month. That's the number that I got. Um, Mark, do you, is that accurate? Do you know what they charge other municipalities? No, not all But I, I called and asked the, the 
uh, the sheriff's <coughs> office and they put me in touch with the guy that's over the jail. He said it was $1,080. If you take the 18 months that Amy had calculated, again, thank you, Amy, um, of the $3,750, you take the uh, almost $19,000 um, opportunity cost. So, so stay with me here. So if, if someone chooses not to go into the program, it's about 19,000 bucks for 18 months. It's a, that's the financial swing and the cost to the county. If they decide to go into the program, they pay $3,750. Mm -hmm. That delta, that's an income versus an expense. So you add those together, it's over $23,000 per participant that's in the program. With just curious if everybody understood the swing and the difference in their choice to go through, go to incarceration <coughs> or go through the program. So for the county, each participant is 23,000 bucks. How many participants are there right now? In our program, I think we have 71. 71. Times 71 people. Mm -hmm. That's a big number. And what I'm here to explain is the math is one thing, but if you go to the graduation and look at how this program changes lives, that is way superior to just the math to the county. So Gary and I talked about this at one time. Most corporations support things like um, babies, the military, um, uh, they're all sexy um, things that you put on your website that you're supporting uh, very popular items. So it's, it's, a, it's a little different when you go in and ask for donations and support for someone that's gone, you know, made some bad decisions about DUI and drugs. Um, it's, it's not as popular to get donations for that. But when you, everybody says something needs to be done about it, but they're, or they don't know where to go to get something that's effective. This program, I think, needs a, a higher profile and a higher priority, and I'm suggesting that the county look at this from a financial standpoint and a human standpoint that you're changing lives and put a greater emphasis on this program and how it's having an effect on the community. So, uh, Gary, I'll turn it over and let you make Well, I'll, I'll just, uh, I don't use a good job, I would just say, um, you know, to me, uh, you know, a lot of it is, is giving people a, a second chance before the incarceration if they go through, um, you know, through the program. And I think it's had a, uh, you know, the economics are a big part and the cost, uh, you know, certainly there. But, but I believe most of the people in this program want to stop the, the, the drug addiction or the alcohol problem. Like they're looking for that. I don't think they want to do this, but they don't know how. They don't have the tools, I guess, to, to do it. And so the structure of this program and the discipline that it brings, the accountability that it brings, brings something into a lot of them's lives that they don't, have never really had to deal with uh, you know, before. And I think that structure, that part of it, uh, helps make them a better citizen ultimately long term too as they begin to see they can do it and the discipline and what it takes to you know to do that but it's certainly a very rigorous program that they go through this is not a uh, a simple thing when they're drug tested uh, you know regularly uh, through the program but the teamwork that they build the support for each other I think they're, they make maybe better friends positive friends the people that they associate with as well so the benefits of this are, are, are really very broad uh, and, and larger than just just what you look at of someone going through a program. It's not a check the box to avoid going to jail. I mean, it really is a, uh, a commitment and I believe, and it's shown by the low recidivism rate, that it really is changing people and making a, uh, a positive impact uh, in their life and back to the community, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you for your support of that as well. Thank you as well. Um, and I'll just and see if anybody has any specific questions <coughs> about the program or what we do or anything like that or the program <coughs> itself. Okay. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, th th thank you, ma'am. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Very, very good. Yep. You, you guys did a great job. and It was very um, concise and accurate. Um, probably back in, 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 just to give broader context, 
Um, I remember I, I sat with, uh, at that time, Chief Judge James, when I first came to office. And my concern was, when, when I, it was about the appearance of, 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 of people going to jail for all types of things that may not be just straight criminal or evil. <coughs> and he, he was very kind in, in educating me. He said, well, Commissioner Robinson, we don't have sentencing options. We need alternative <coughs> sentencing options. That was early on. And I said, okay, I got it. So fast forward to 2015, uh, when the accountability course was just coming online, and I'm out at, uh, in Savannah at ACCG, and I'm in a room, about 500 other commissioners, and the lady from the state said, she made a comment saying, yes, we can't sustain the state prison system. And it's, it's how she said, it's like, oh, this is about money. <coughs> and so the whole point of pushing it down to the local level is that the state couldn't handle it. I'm looking at them like, okay, y'all about to drop this at the local level. No problem. Um, so to bring forward, we've got these accountability courts, which I'm, I'm always for. This, this is important. And the conversation you guys know consistent, I've said, but okay, we gotta fund this. I've been saying this for the longest. We gotta fund this, right? It, it, and so I, I get, I appreciate, I mean, I, I followed the opportunity because you, you got right to what I needed to hear. Like I've been saying that, God, this is our responsibility. I appreciate the court's um, involvement from an intervention perspective. Um, I just left um, Church of Chapel Hill this morning, um, gave greetings on behalf of Madam Chair um, in the county for um, the mental health. They were doing suicide prevention, hall room full of, of, of pastors and stuff locally. So this is obviously relevant. But as I, as I look at this, it's like, guys, we're gonna have to, fuck. this becomes a court, right? So my whole point of pushing over the past couple years, whether it's for the grant for the mental health, or for Judge McLean, or all of them, all these courts is, guys, we gotta make a real commitment. Okay? I don't know what that number is, but to really sustain this, and I appreciate the comment about the recidivism. Okay. And so what do you say, less than 4%, um, do we know how many people actually just don't go through it though, and just choose to go to, just like, I'm just gonna jump in the box. <coughs> do we know what that number is, or is it, do they at least try? They just, they fall away. Well, the program isn't for everyone. Some people just decide they'd rather go sit in jail. They're not ready to make a change in their life. Okay. All we can do is give them the opportunity and the choice. And, you know, fortunately, I think most people we've presented do, do do that, do make that choice. But not everybody does. There might be a, a housing issue or that maybe the, it's a work issue or something where they just... They, can't, they know they can't be successful, and we don't want to set somebody up for failure. Right. You know, no matter what we can do, they have to be willing to work with us to do it. So not everybody is, but I think probably, I would say most of the people that are offered the opportunity, if they're eligible, accept it. So. All right, so now, I'll, all right, so we, we, we've helped with putting transportation in play. We appreciate you guys' support, making sure people can get to court, be accountable, all those things. So if I had to ask the question, what is it that you need? I, mean, I heard to imply um, a, a broader awareness and perhaps an implied commitment. Well, I'm hoping that over the next couple months as we go into the budget cycle, that gets to be quantified. Because we would look to you guys to say, well, what is that? What does that look like? Is it would, housing? Is it services? What, what are you asking? It's a combination of those. It's definitely housing. We have a number of our participants that live in I don't know how to transitional. It. Transitional housing, mm -hmm. male and female. Um, we do have, a, uh, most of our participants are employed, but some do need help with job skills and, and finding work. And we do work with them on that uh, in our case management. So, and then a number of them don't have, because of their number of DUIs or their legal situation, they don't have driver's licenses. So the public transportation helps, but they also, you know, do need to, you know, some of them have to Uber or whatever to get to their meetings and such. So help in figuring out, you know, tran transportation as well as housing are probably our biggest needs as well at this time. Yes. Uh, and figuring out a way to, to make that happen is, is something that we're always looking at and working on. Uh, and our foundation supports us somewhat in that way. I think they provided some Uber cards <coughs> in the past to participants and things of that nature, or gas cards to participants. So that's that's what that the foundation has been doing in helping our participants with those kinds of issues. Okay. And we do get some transitional housing money from the state, but it's limited. So, well, okay, this is my last point. To your point, we appreciate um, obviously nonprofits, uh, Greystone, Gary Miller. Thank you 
for, for being a, a good corporate citizen here, all right? So everybody's contributing. It's, it's sort of that charitable, good corporate we're working. So, I'm, but I'm listening from the perspective like, okay, how are you going to scale this? How are you going to sustain this? There's, at some point, it becomes institutional. It moves beyond just the we we love our community to a point where what I'm hearing is like, okay, you're a real court though, guys, and you're doing an excellent job of doing the best you got with what you got. But I'm sitting here like, okay, but this is a court. So I guess at some point we're going to have to transition, and I'd love to get, and again, I'll, I'll leave it at that, Madam Chair, which is, can we put a little bit more time over the next couple months, please? But what does that future state look like? I get today, but if, if, you're, if there's a real ask for a commitment, then we need to plan for that. Right. I don't want it to be where, okay, we now got, you know, you got 150, 200 people in the pipe and we can't get to them because we haven't properly planned. And, and so if we can at least anticipate what that is, like, I mean, right now there's no commitment. I'm not, it, what we're asking for is more information to better understand what your ask is. But what I'm hearing is it's awesome. But the point is how do we scale that now and be part of our fabric, be part of the, it, it runs itself. So I'm excited. I heal them. Just One of the stuff. ten guiding okay. principles for accountability courts is sustainability long term. That's one of right. the things that we're required to do as part of our ten guiding principles right. is to develop that into our program. So we're always thinking about that, working towards that. So thank you. I would suggest if I could just interject very briefly. Um, could you go to the podium? If, if you want me to, judge. do whatever you yeah, tell me judge. to do. <laughs> I think that was judge. <laughs> the uh, you know, as far as where we are. Historically, since we've undergone criminal justice reform, a lot of money was put into these types of programs through grant funds. That's where we're, we're primarily grant funded right now. For this to work, we have to have total buy-in from the community, from the folks here at this table, from our local companies and businesses who are willing to invest in a local community, and I think that's what we're drawing to Douglas County from sort of a business standpoint as well. I think for us, when you realize that I don't even process the numbers on this. I mean, I know I should. I mean, other people do, but I'm looking at lives that are changed every day. You know, I've been in this a, a while now. You know, my hair is starting to turn gray. I've seen all of our mistakes, and now I'm starting to. When you have people who flag me down at church and put their arms around me and say, "Y'all changed my life with drug court or DUI court or this," it, it's a life changer. I mean, you realize you're you're changing people's lives, and I think for us, we always have this concern. Well, what if the grant money runs out? What if the grant money runs out? So we want to get the word out there about how positive the program is so we can build that type of support. So if in the future something like that should happen, it's hard to deny the success of these programs nationwide now. So I don't think that's going to happen. We would be foolish as a society for that to happen. But we have to be prepared, as you know. We always have to be prepared and have, and have somewhat of a plan. And at least we're looking forward. And so we're at that stage where we're wanting to build sort of that overall support and awareness of the success of the program. So if we face those challenges, um, we'll be willing to step up and do what we have to do. But I'm just telling you, we have I think we have graduation coming up October 4th, I believe. I think it's October 4th. The first Thursday. Of first October. Thursday in October. It's at Chapel Hill High and School. And it's at Chapel Hill High School. And we would invite everyone to come take a look at that. And you can see the success and hear from the people who've actually gone through the program and not from from us, but I've seen those lives changed, and it, it, it changes you as a person being involved in, in any aspect of the criminal justice system. But um, I just hope that as, as some sort of a holistic standpoint, as a community from the government to our private sector, our court system, and everybody is really kind of coming together on the same page on this, and that's really what we're here, to make some noise about it and to share with you so you all can make some noise about how positive the program is and to tell other businesses, hey, take a look at this. This is a way you can help, kind of a thing. So we appreciate the support. that Y'all been very responsive and supportive when we needed it, and we very much appreciate that. And I just want you to know, I'm seeing the results in people's lives with everything that, that we're doing here in Douglas County with our, our, our alternative courts top to bottom. And we're the envy of the state, really. I'm just telling you, we've been through a lot of audits and things, and the way we're doing it from top to bottom, the way we're all working together, felony and misdemeanor, mental health, all of that, um, it's it's working. So I thank you guys and just help us raise awareness on it so we can face any challenges that come. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. If I could make one last comment. Okay. So uh, between Deary and I, we've, we've raised about 30 grand. Our focus has been to um, give those dollars directly to the participants. Mm -hmm. 
We feel like um, sponsoring someone that's going through a tough time that can't get to, you know, and the option is to go to jail. So we'll help them. We don't we don't ever sponsor something a hundred percent. Gary and I, you know, feel like everybody needs skin in the game. That they need to, you know, have some money in it. Otherwise, it's free. They're just going to quit. Right. So um, we we partner with the participants. I want to let you know that any donation that someone makes, we're very conscientious with their money that it goes directly to the participants to affect their success of the program. We're being being very cautious with our support. So. Thank you. I believe we have a question for Commissioner Guider. Uh, and this is to Judge Barker, I guess. Uh, would you tell the public how many accountability courts we now have okay. in place? Sure. In, in, in Douglas County? Uh-huh. Yes. And, well, there's um, Judge McLean has a felony drug court. Mr. Pruitt's here on behalf of them. Um, and then Judge Adams is overseeing a felony or a mental health court. It's not limited to felonies, I think, folks. Uh, with misdemeanor offenses as well are eligible for that. And then we have a DUI drug court program, which is divided into two separate treatment tracks. I oversee the high risk track, Judge Fortner oversees the moderate risk track. So it's one program, but it's split based on their the participants needs and, and they get different treatment depending on those needs. And so that's our, so we have those three. And then I believe there's a, the juvenile court has a family treatment court program as well that Judge Walker Overseas as and well. START uh, helps with all of these accountability courts. No, START helps with uh, our court mostly. And, and the DUI and drug. The DUI drug yeah. court. Yeah. Right. I think the mental health court. Do you have a separate foundation yet, uh, Tim? We don't have a foundation for nonprofit. What we use this board for is for an advisory council for us, which is a huge assistance for us. That's a checkbox process that we needed to go through, and they agree to sit as that for us, but they have assisted us on some small things and we're deeply appreciative of those. But yeah, this, this foundation supports the, the DUI drug court program. But this uh, certainly helps the occupancy rate at the jail quite Absolutely. a bit. Uh, do you have any number uh, that it has helped keep people out of jail? Currently, there's 160 people that are not in jail because they're in our program. Right, so that's why so that occupancy that's, rate as, is, as, as of today, there's 160 yeah. people that are not in jail. Not to mention all the people that we've all have passed through all those programs over the past year. And I can get you in historical numbers that you like. I would yeah. like to have it. Um, uh, we we have the sanctuary city down there at the old landfill at the landfill. Um, are y'all utilizing that yet? I'll let Mr. Pruitt address that. That's his, that's his. I, was, I was here for support. I was not here to speak. Sorry. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, Sanctuary Village is still under construction uh, and has not gotten its certificate of occupancies to put anybody in it yet. So nobody. will house how many people? And that is a great question, which I will say is between. Uh, because there are some family units there where you could have more than one occupant okay. uh, because you might have three in there. They're a family unit, uh, so that's difficult to answer. But let's just put a number of 15 out there as a good round number to work off of because that might can, that can go up and down, but we'll just say 15. They have a 15. tremendous 15. 15. They have a tremendous issue that they're dealing with in housing, and you know you, you hate to call something real, real high risk. But their risk level is so much higher than ours that they're dealing with a challenge that we're not necessarily dealing with as much. And they're dealing with people who can't have housing for a number of reasons and challenges. And so that's primarily something Judge McLean is doing that's very needed. Um, you know, we're, we're involved on the outskirts with that. But they're facing some tremendous challenges in housing for our felony drug court population that we may not necessarily be facing. Ours is a little bit different of a challenge. Just to highlight that, I want to step further, Judge, I really appreciate that. Uh, my felony offenders can't rent an apartment in this county for 99 years. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not even available to them if they could afford it. So, I mean, the number of housing options that they have is dramatically. Is that is that a state law? Or no, ma'am. That, that is, what has happened is the rental market has changed over the last 
decade. And there is such a demand for rent, for rental units in this community, that apartment complexes can put new standards out and say, well, we'll do this, and we'll do this, and we'll do this, because it's better for them as a business model. Uh, so they can absolutely say any prior felony has to be 99 years old. They don't believe in forgiveness, I guess. <laughs> we haven't cracked that particular egg yet. <laughs> okay. Um, they've, got, they've got housing with felony issues and then employment with felony issues. I mean, we're really actively trying to change that the aspect to, to employing mm -hmm. people, but it's just an additional challenge. Not only can they not find a place, a lot of them can't get a job because of that felony as well. So it's, a, it's some extreme challenges. In, in well, you know, I work with a, a, a great with Celebrate Recovery down at Ephesus. We've done, been doing it for 15 years now, but we've got like four around Douglas County, and the judges use us as required meetings mm -hmm. and, and everything. Uh, but I've had people come through there that were homeless and I had no place to send them other than uh, not Ford's place. They come to us, uh, we don't have the funds, we don't have funds other than uh, what we, uh, the small amount we use to run the program. But uh, the housing part of someone that has been thrown out of the house because they cross that line with their parents or loved ones, whoever, and they have no place to go, but they're broken. And it's very hard to see a man cry because uh, his family had turned against him, but he said it was his fault, you know. But then he had he'd been lit, sleeping in his car right. behind a Walmart or someplace for the past week, and we had no place to send him. I did refer him to the Dr. Ford's place up on Highway 78 because it, there is a shelter there for a man. But we have people come through there a lot of times that are homeless. And I don't guess there's anybody we can call on a Friday night at 9 o'clock to see where can we place this person, is it? Not yet. Okay. And so I work, I sit on the Homeless Task Force, one of the United Way foundations here in Douglas County as a board member. And one of the things that we're working on is in that group, so putting on a different hat right now, um, is supporting Sanctuary Village and bringing case management services online for that village mm -hmm. uh, through the United Way and working with that group. And that's what that person might actually end up being. Is, is that resource for what do you do at 9 o'clock at night because what everyone up here understands and what I think that everyone at this table understands is that housing is fundamental to healing. You yes. cannot get better mm -hmm. without shelter. And food. And we do have a food pantry. So, uh, so yes. we could accommodate that, but he had no place to prepare it any day. But uh, I, if you ever get anybody on the staff that we can call on Friday nights to refer. That is uh, very close to happening. Very good, very good. A number of months, if not a number of weeks. By the way, that gen the last gentleman that we came across like that ended up in jail, back in jail. So I have to still a lot of that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I okay, I'm sorry. Sure. Okay, but well, thank you so much, Judge Barker and Judge Fortner and Mr. Miller and Mr. DeNice for your amazing presentation. Um, certainly, you all have you are a catalyst for life-changing, positive outcomes for the citizens of Douglas County, and your program is number one in the United States, not just in Georgia. Uh, I, I'm in several rooms talking to uh, counties, especially when I'm uh, on some of these. Uh, Commissioner Conference, and we talk about, I talk about, I tout, should I say, about our accountability programs, and they said they just touched the helmet of your <laughs> because they said they cannot believe how uh, efficient and proficient that you all have been here in Douglas County. And so I just wanted to extend my appreciation for you. And the support is from the Board of Commissioners. We will continue to support you. Appreciate it. Please graduation. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, yes. I was at the last one, I believe mm -hmm. I had. A little late, but I will be attending. Probably not a dry eye in the house. I know. I always bring my 
clinics. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, Board of Commissioners, we have approval of the minutes. Uh, tomorrow, I just ask if you, yeah, well, not tomorrow, wow. Um, <laughs> Tuesday, next week, I ask you to take a, a look at this over the weekends uh, during the holiday time. Just peek at your uh, minutes and then you'll be uh, prepared uh, to approve accordingly next Tuesday. Uh, County Administrator, you have two business items, tab number five and six. Uh, tab five is authorization for Georgia Power to install street lights at I-20 Post Road at a cost of $9,103 to be paid by the 2016 SPLOSS bonds and authorized chairman to sign all documents. And then tab number six is authorization for Greystone to install street lights at I-20 and Liberty Road, Highway 5, Chapel Hill Road, Lee Road, and Thornton Road at a cost of $86,627.53 to be paid by uh, the 2016 SPLOSS bonds and authorized the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, County Administrator Mark Teal. Um, yes, ma'am. I've been working with Jordan Power and Greystone on these as well as the other streets too. We're getting close on those, so we'll have those to the board soon. Um, so the I-20 and Coast Road uh, street lights, there's an additional cost, which is not SPLOSS funded, which will be a monthly fee of $386.05. And then for Liberty Road, Highway 5, Chapel Hill, yeah, Chapel Hill, Lee Road, and Thornton Road, on the Greystone lights, there is a monthly charge um, of $273. Fairburn Road is not included. Um, George DOT and the city of Douglasville are working on the street lights at Fairburn Road. Okay. Any questions from the board for our county administrator? Yes. Okay. Commissioner Dyer, you said who else? Oh, no. Uh, uh, Liberty. Right? Oh, yeah. Liberty. Liberty. Did the city of El Rico go in with us on the loop? Yes, they did. So okay. those are not included here. Those are in the those are in the intersections and in the street that we're getting prices on. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, City of Villa Rica uh, will be paying for it. I think it's with Georgia Power, if I remember correctly. One light. Yes. Yeah, so one light at Liberty Road and that Highway 78 loop, and then we're we will be proposing in the future to pay for the other one, which is at Highway 78 and Highway 78. So they played for one, we'll, we'll propose Okay, that, I know they were going to vote on it after we had a, a, yes. the night of the, our last meeting, so I just wondered how yeah, that Yeah, that's went. correct. Okay, thank you. I'll back. Okay. Commissioner Robinson? Um, real quick, um, two things. Can I get an accounting um, of, of our, our, how much we pay in street lights countywide? I'd like to know what that number is. Director Holman, not today, but just provide that number. I'm just curious uh, what that is. Second question is, and well, the second thing is, uh, what is the schedule for this? Um, I'm joking, but I'm not. Uh, which is, you know, putting street lights up was an experience for us uh, last time around, and um, I believe that it, it should go more efficient. Um, and this is lots of dollars. So, what assurances and what commitment are we getting? regarding putting these in. Because uh, when we go out, we're, we're, we're <coughs> pouting. Look what we're doing for the community. Look how we're beautifying all of these things. And then it's like 18 months later, it's not a good look. So the expectations that are being spoken versus the delivery don't match. Um, County Administrator, are, do we have a schedule when we think that these will come online? Are these built into the, the, the SPLOSS project mm -hmm. schedule? You don't know the answer, that's okay. But that, no, I that's do not have the answer yet. Now, Greystone is here to possibly help with their question. I don't think Georgia Power is, but the first step, the power company will have to go, each prospective power company will have to get a permit from Georgia DOT. So that's the first step. Okay. <coughs> so we are required to do that. Once we get there, how long do you think that'll take? A couple months? Just on those Greystone Power, yeah, the, the per depends. permit, we don't know. Um, you know, it's something that we will work through. Um, that will be kind of the, uh, the critical path uh, for us right now. Uh, we did learn lessons. Uh, thank you. Um, we, we all learned lessons from uh, from previous projects, uh, and we'll continue to move forward as quickly as possible uh, on every street lighting project we do. Just let us know what the schedule. You know, once you get to a place where you can actually scope a schedule, you know, lay it out. Let us know. We're not trying to get ahead. We just want to set a public's expectation. Sure. That's all. 
Services contracts for the firms of Michael Baker Corporation, Southeastern Engineering Corporation, C, uh, I'm sorry, GCA, Han, Neil Schaefer, BM and K, H and L, Engineers Incorporation, the THC, um, Croy Engineering LLC in Maldina, and Wilborn and Low Engineers to provide services for transportation projects as needed by the county and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentini. Yes, uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. This item was before the board about a month ago, and this is the way it was presented at that time. However, after um, it was remanded back to committee, we went uh, before the uh, purchasing committee and had a discussion about it, and subsequent to that, back to the transportation committee. And there's only five consultants that are being recommended to move forward. And that is the firm of Michael Baker uh, to work on the state route and Riverside Drive intersection project, JCA, GCA, to uh, potentially do work on uh, State Route 92 in Mount Vernon intersection if it should be here. Uh, Pond and Company to work on State Route 5 at Douglas Boulevard. Uh, low engineers to work on Maxim Road Cycle Project and THC to work on the Chapel Hill uh, inter four intersection project for right of way acquisition. So only those uh, five firms are being considered uh, at this time. Okay. Any questions from the board? Comment? Uh, Commissioner Robinson? Yeah, all right. So this agenda item, what you said, are they aligned? Meaning, um, all right, so let's just make sure we understand. So the five projects that you just mentioned are the five firms that are being awarded against that. Those are, <coughs> this is um, what was expressed out of the transportation committee. And only those five projects and only those five firms, uh, and it's a one-time task, and this is not an ongoing three-year assignment or one-year re-ups. Is that clear? Well, uh, Commissioner, we uh, started the process out with a request for qualifications. Uh, before we can engage the firms, we have to complete that process. So we would award them an on-call uh, contract based on that solicitation. However, we're not committed to doing any more work than what's been approved in the <coughs> so we, Again, so let's say it's awarded for these five. In the language of the actual agreement, there is no consideration. <coughs> this is just a task order single item. There's no words that implies or expresses that this is three years or multi-year. It's just a one time. Is that accurate? It, the uh, the way the contract typically reads, it says not to exceed one year or the duration of the task, whichever comes first. I'm, I'm fine with task. Okay, I want to make sure legal. I just want to make sure we're clear on what is, is task oriented. Okay, all right. So um, I'm fine with those five projects, those five firms, mm -hmm. as is completed. <coughs> but once we're done, we're not setting expectations that they will have. The next right set of right away is right. I mean, I'm just using whoever you mentioned, Pond or whoever, THK, whatever they were. Um, that once they finish that right away acquisition, they're not on demand for ongoing. It's just work at hand. I'm trying to stay at this scope of work right here because I know you got another item we'll talk about. But are we? Are we? Do we understand that? I'm very clear on that. Okay. That uh, before we consider uh, them, we would go through a different process. Got it. Qualifying other firms. Yeah. We're good. No further questions. Go ahead. Okay. Commissioner um, uh, Carpenter. Mm -hmm. 
Director Miguel, can you talk to us about the process just a little um, about these firms that they are already GDOT certified and That's kind correct. of what that entails as far yes. as minority participation? That is correct. And any For any project that has federal or state funds, the firms have to be GDOT pre-qualified. And so all of these firms are. Now, if we were using a firm for a local project, they encourage us to use firms that are pre-qualified. We probably would want somebody with the same capabilities, but we do not have to have that requirement. And so everybody that you are giving a task order to um, for the upcoming five projects are GDOT certified, and they understand the MBE participation costs within, within the contract. And we appear those because we're taking federal dollars and we want to make sure that we are in compliance, correct? That is correct. And, and the stipulation as to the DBE requirement was embedded in this uh, solicitation, okay. but it will also be part of the actual contract where we engage the firm. These contracts are only um, to have them on standby. Mm -hmm. When we negotiate a cost for the task, that contract will come back to the board and it will have the stipulation of the DB requirement as well. And am I under the assumption that doing the pre-qual this way, it is to save the county money going forward for these task items? Absolutely, because uh, the, way, the way the process was <coughs> uh, a firm that does say survey for right-of-way acquisition typically becomes a sub to a larger firm. And there is a markup in the cost. The way we structured it, those firms can be the prime themselves and cut out that markup that we normally see. Thank you so much. I yield Thank you, Madam. Thank you, ma'am. Um, did you say THC? was the one chosen for the Highway 5 uh, right turn lane, northbound right turn lane? No, uh, uh, Pond and Company. Pond? Mm -hmm. Pond, okay. Um, now, that is a state highway. Yes. And, of course, we've got the city saying they will help pay for this. Have we addressed this with the GDOT to see if they were frozen money in there? It is a state highway. We have not approached uh, GDOT about funding, but uh, I mean, that's something we could look into in the future. However, the, the process for lining up funding usually has to go through a solicitation, and the award, if you're successful, may take nine months. So if we were to go that route, we would have to delay this until that gets long. We, we don't want to do that, but <laughs> um, can we ask for reimbursement? Only upon going through that process. Only and through going, I mean, that can't, the solicitation we can't be process. applying for reimbursement at the time while we're proceeding with the project itself. Normally they do not reimburse unless you have been approved prior to engaging in the process. So we would have had to have had GDOT approval and participation on the project before doing a contract for design for them to reimburse us. So we can't do it after the fact. Did we have to get their approval to do this? Have, no. we, have we gotten their approval? <laughs> we, we've had discussions with them. Um, but at the time when we engage the consultant, that's when we start having the discussions with the GDOT personnel about the details of the, of the project. So they still have to bless the program? They do. The project. They do, because it's, it's their road. They certainly will be involved, just not financially. Okay. Shame, shame. Okay. Thank you. I'll yield back. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, motion Yeah, just one clarify. So we're, we're, again, this all started with, um, to your point, last month, uh, a month or so ago, um, the request for um, 
the awarding of 11 standby consulting contracts. And so now we, there was um, a remand back down to the committee to rethink that approach. I want to clarify that what we're saying is that only five contracts are being awarded and we're not awarding the other six. It's what we're not saying here as well. I want to make sure we're clear that there's not some type of implied like there was 11, only five get contracts. That means there's still six outstanding that we still want to address in some type of future process. Um, is that accurate? That's your understanding? That is correct. Okay. All right. We will take care. I mean, I guess that's being addressed in procurement. And so, um, okay. I want to make sure that, okay, so only five, so that we're not confused. There's six that's remaining for us raised to on demand, and we'll address them in the future. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, we move on to tab number eight. Authorization to approve supplemental agreement SA-01 with the Corporate Group LLC in the amount of $135,296.21 for plan changes resulting in additional quantities of materials on the Whitestone culvert, uh, culvert replacement project to be funded by the 2016 SWAPS per recommendation from the Transportation Committee and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Valentin. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, this um, supplemental agreement is it's necessary uh, due to some changes in the foundation uh, for the culvert. Uh, we've had extensive discussion back and forth with the uh, uh, contract, the consultant, and uh, we, we have come to concur that uh, this is necessary in order to move the project forward. Uh, the, the changes in the foundation actually were substantial and resulted in, in some instances, as much as a 40% increase in some of the items like concrete and the like. So uh, this would allow us to uh, go back and uh, keep the project moving. Okay. Uh, this is uh, certainly um, the record of Valentin and other English projects. I believe mean, this was the first project I signed off in 2017. We've been talking about this for five years. So I'm, I'm excited, team. I understand it's been on the record, 10, but I signed off in 2017 so we can move it forward. And I'm telling you, it's just been turning. So it's 31 um, months <coughs> later, 33 months later. So sounds like we're going to finally get some traction and get some things moving mm -hmm. and get this to sort of, okay, all right. Sounds good, any questions from the board, Commissioner? Yeah. Vice Chairman. Yeah, yeah. I, and, and, and to that point, I, I want to echo uh, the historical, this this project, um, you know, I'm very sensitive to HOAs and communities, and obviously coming out of the Great Recession and the Great Flood that we had in 09 and all that impact, uh, but this is one of those where this project should have been done. Um, I do appreciate Madam Guy what she had to go. She really didn't. She shouldn't have had to go through what she had to go through to get developers and get money. Mm -hmm. Like why she? Why? why it, and I, so I, I appreciate her commitment uh, to negotiate with the developer to get him more skin in the game. Uh, I, I think this would. This is one of those like this should have been done. There's no way that this should have been isolated. But it was. It, was, it is what it is. Uh, but I appreciate that. Uh, um, <coughs> Madam Chair, your commitment to ensuring that this gets done. And obviously the committee was something, and, and Commissioner Mulcair, when he was here, this is just one of those, like, no, let that go through. So it, it just needed to move, so we had to move moving forward. So well done to, to Madam Dyer for her, um, obviously, advocacy, but this one, because it it's, it's well over there. That's way too long. Okay. I do. Thank you. I'll just thank you for, I'll thank you for that, uh, Commissioner Robinson, but I want you to thank the people out there in that subdivision for their their patience. This has been going on since 2009. The subdivision has literally been cut in half. But the price has gone up because of dragging our feet. Uh, that's a, it was going to be a prefab bridge that was put together like a puzzle. And then I don't know what happened with that, but it just kind of escalated. Uh, I hate that the cost has gone up so much, but as you state many times, the cost of uh, concrete and things like that continue to go up and everything. And now, um, I, I just wonder, do you have a timeline on the construction works right? When will the fat lady sing? <laughs> 
Uh, under, <coughs> under the contract, they have 270 days to complete the project. So 270 days from um, once this change order is approved on Tuesday. So you don't know when they will actually break ground, start? Uh, they're, they're eager to break ground. They, essentially, they have been doing administrative work in anticipation of this. <coughs> Uh, so, so they should be going, uh, getting things into ground fairly quickly. Initially, of course, it's going to be removing uh, excavation on the like, but they should be out there working uh, within weeks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, <Matt. laughs> I'm Commissioner Carlton. Director Valentin, if you just please remember. This may not be for you, Director Valentin, oh, but. Um, we see that the total contract price is a million and three. Only eight hundred thousand is being taken out of this loss. Where's the other half a million coming from? That that's uh, some of the contributions. Some of it from um, uh, the developer, initial developer uh, of the subdivision. Mm -hmm. Some of it is from the state under the Elnick mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. Yes. WSA also. And WSA and the county. And WSA. So we received years ago that we assigned fund balance and set it aside for when this time came. Mm -hmm. Okay, Why? so this has already been set aside. Yes. So under fund balance, under contributions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we got on the subdivision. When they went under. Just want to make things transparent and clear for the citizens as we continue to move forward and doing the business of the county. These funds are, are being allocated and set aside to make sure that we can move things out right. Certainly, and, and this uh, item will, will facilitate uh, releasing those funds for purposes of, of the project. Well. Wonderful. Thank you. I know that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Parker. All right, we'll move on to tab number nine, authorization to grant a right-of-way easement to Greystone Power Corporation in order to move a power pole at Clint Nature Preserve and for the Chairman to sign all related documents. Director Gary Dukes. Yes, ma'am. We have a light pole that's in our way where we uh, intend on constructing the new trailhead out at Clinton, mm -hmm. and we just need to get that pole moved uh, so we can, uh, when we're ready to construct the trailhead, it won't be in our way. Okay. Any questions from board of commissioners? Um, Commissioner Governor? Yes. Uh, Gary, now that's not the pole that's out there in the field. Right there, is it? Mm -hmm. There's, uh, this is on the trail. This is this pole <coughs> is just adjacent to the White House, mm -hmm. uh, where we want to construct the trailhead because that's where all the trails begin. So, but are they going to just move it to uh, over some? Yes. Or? Okay, yeah. they're not removing it. No, okay. no, we're just moving it out of the way. All right, all right, that's what I wanted to do. Thank you. Okay, you're back. Pretty self explanatory. Thank you so much, yes, Director Dukes. Uh, tab number 10 authorization to approve a service agreement with Whitlock for audiovisual equipment in the Emergency Operations Center in the amount of $12,822.75 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Neil Holland. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, this is um, in the Merch Operations Center and the, and then the conference room that I have. We have audiovisual equipment for. Um, it's pretty substantial, and uh, we have a we've had an ongoing contract with Whitlock that initially started when we built the Mercy Operations Center. Mm -hmm. So they come in um, twice a year and just run it through its paces. Also, when I have a problem, I can call them. They're on call for me to come and say, "Come fix this. I have a problem," and they've been very responsive in the past. And I can get somebody there normally within a, within a, um, a day, get yeah, and look at at least diagnose the problem and or the parts, of course. Now, I've used them more and more over the last two years that we're going on, what, seven, eight years now. This equipment's um, going on. I, I guess I, I forget that. And I'll, the first time I'm going to say something about something breaking, and I say, well, you know, that's eight years old. And I said, well, I still want it to work. So, but they come out, and so they, um, we, we do call on this contract a lot with them. So I'm just asking them to renew the contract uh, again and, uh, for the year. and. Go for it. Okay. Um, I just have one question for you. So yes. If the system is eight years old, are we enhanced, placing some enhancements on it, or are we just 
I, I, I'm repairing parts. Uh, I'm just repairing. I'm trying. I'm, I always look for. You know, I've actually like when the some of the equipment goes out, I'll start looking for other. If I, I can find a part cheaper than they can, they still have to install it. I'll find a replacement part in another way, as long as they're a vendor, and get it for them and say, hey, put, hey, you put it in because of their when, when they get it and their their stuff. I can sometimes find it cheaper, sometimes I can't. But always, that's the first thing I always do is look and see what you know what what's going out. What can I find it cheaper? If I can, I get it in. They they'll come in and uh, uh, install it into the the, the computer rack. Because you know we, we need the bulk of technologies just advancing every day. So yeah, it's, it's, it's like probably might to start looking on our next um, yeah. looking forward is the some equipment. But I mean, I think initially that equipment there was close to eighty, ninety thousand dollars or better. So I mean, it's um, but that's why you don't really want to replace it all at one time and. But you need to do have need to have a plan to say, okay, how are we going to move forward? We're going to place the um, the screens with you know, a computer wall or whatever. Uh, you know, how how are you going to move forward? But it, you know, it's a very expensive process. Right. I'll just ask as you as we prepare to go into the next year, not for this budget, if you could just come up with a phase plan. It sounds like you're going to phase in those parts. Yes. But okay. Uh, any questions for the board? Any comments, uh, Commissioner? But I was just going to ask. If would it not be cheaper to go ahead and replace it? But, um, yeah. If the maintenance is is eight thousand dollars a year. Yeah, I mean, we've been. I mean, actually, we've been. You know, the main, even when it was new, after it went out of warranty, this is the the cost of it. There's so with the Crestron, the Fit Special, and the Cisco people they bring in to work on it. Their cost is just that's what you're paying for. Even if you get a new system, as soon as it's out of warranty, you're gonna you're gonna pay this to someone. You know, it, and so you, you usually get about two to three year warranty on it, and after that, after that times up, and if we replaced it, we'd, we'd be all right for two or three years. Then, then we'd be playing and probably now with the newer equipment. I bet they'd want more than that. The uh, the wiring was put in with the building, so that cost you wouldn't have that. It's the hardware, yeah. The wire, yeah, it's, it's, things pretty wired, but, but like if you move something or change something, like what the new the new greatest thing is, instead of having the drop down screens like projectors. It's having a, wall, a big wall like with your mono mono board, but it covers the whole wall where your screens are. That's the that's what new operation centers are doing. But that's the entire would, wall. Yeah, is, is that okay. you can put, and you can put up different things with it. Of course, we monitor different television stations during weather events to know what's going on, as well as monitoring our contact. But we have a constant feed from GEMA and other counties keeping what's going on as we're working through stuff. So on the new walls, they just had to the wall segmented out in different areas. That's a new thing that was, of course, not available when we built our center. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 All right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, to, to this point, I mean, you know, when I, when I, we don't get to talk to you very much, which is a good, you know, it's good. It's not a bad thing, but I, I'm I always keep my my eye on what you provide. It's not a non-essential function. It's, you have to have it. Uh, it's just preventative. If I think about the money we spent on cameras in the jail, <coughs> replacing it twice, why are we pausing on this? Um, and I'd like to know what the cost is. I mean, if we're going to commit to public safety, then commit. Uh, it should be we, we, we be consistent in the application of policy. We said, well, if this is essential, right, then it is what it is. Um, I, I look at, um, and, and again, I, I, I get it, everything, count the costs, I get that. But it's one of those where, again, I just listen to the reasoning over time, and it's like, yeah, but this, it's, it's that important. We can replace the cameras to sort of see what's going on with it within our jail, and so that's important. And we we just replace them. One fell swoop, but yet there's a there's a rationale approach to preventative, which is people who are not in trouble, who perhaps. And, and again, it's just um, it's more of a, a statement to, to acknowledge how important that is. And I, I know I appreciate the humbleness in which the subject that request, you know, what's before us, but it's just. Mm -hmm. no. So here's my question. So I, I said all I'd say, just, just my, my, my perspective, my position. The question is, if we um, can 
is this a communication tool? Then can our spots be used? I don't know how it ties in with communication. Does it tie audio visual? I mean, I get it. I'm trying to, I'm going somewhere with this, and it, it may not, but um, perhaps the county administrator and the county attorney can just, y'all can go offline and figure out, can this be, can it, can, is this a communication, can this, can the communication part of the SPLOS, knowing that y'all save some money, can that savings be used here as a communication? Does it tie into all of 911? Does it tie into the police? Is there some type of feed here that can be reasoned or to, for, for funding of this? And yeah, one bill soon. In, in my opinion, no, because of the way that SPLOS was written on the, on the radio system. Now, it could be on the, on the, um, like a console, having a console in there, we're, we're working on that on this. <coughs> Actually working out of the spots, having a console for this. So I bring in a, a, a 911 operator right. from uh, Director Whitaker's group that work in our EOC. Right. And that we're going to have a, like a mini console there so we can see their screen, but the, right. their screen. But it, but for good. the other stuff, no, but for that portion, of because mm -hmm. it's a radio console, part of that, you know, it's the radio stuff right. for that, but for a radio system that they need so we can help keep what's going on the EOC so we're not having these portables all the time. That portion of it, we, we've already got planned into this with the spot because it's the actual radio communication part of it. I got you. Did you see where I was going? Yes. Sir. But you know sometimes when I think Wall Street you have multiple screens, I'm like, but could you could it be blended? Could you just have one big it's, it's just Star Trek, right? You just it's everything right there, right? Yes, I, I, they're, I, they're pretty neat. The new, the new ones are neat. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're you know, of course, the, of course, ten years from now, where we'll be here, I'll be talking yeah. about what the what the, what the, what the next the great thing next looks generation. like. No, I get it. Okay, I get it. but you got where I was going. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I get it. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to tab number eleven, authorization to amend the general fund budget for the G dot funds in the amount of five hundred sixty-five thousand six hundred dollars for the 2017 Lee Road project expenditures that were originally determined as non-reimbursable. Uh, Director Hallman, and I have a question for you before you even start. Are these funds, are they the funds from the, uh, the 1.3 million that we took off the budget, uh, yes. our uh, 2018 budget, I believe that's what we have to expense out of that budget to cover this cost. So that was, uh, I believe the total cost was 1.3 million in the originally. So do we have a plan of action for recapturing the additional 700,000 plus some change? What, what's that plan? Do we have one? Is working any? with Miguel, uh, well, prior to working with Miguel, uh, Michelle and I, that was one of the last things that we did before she retired was to fully reconcile the Greta fund um, to make sure that it was made whole for the expenditures that were spent out of that fund and then anything remaining would go to the general fund. Um, you are correct, um, in 2017, um, it was found that the, uh, there were items um, being charged to the Greta Fund for our Gale, um, that were then later determined to be non-reimbursable, and those were 1,379,101. Mm -hmm. um, we um, did get or did receive a check um, from GDOT this year of just under 800000 um, but of course, some of that needed to be for current expenditures that were incurred in that fund. Therefore, that's why the remainder of the $565,600 could go back to help recoup some of the 1.3. Um, Miguel might be able to shed a little bit of more light on anything pending that we have. I know that, um, and, and Michelle speaking with, um, Mahala uh, downstairs that there were still some properties that were under condemnation that still we probably may get reimbursed for. It's just got to work its process out. But I don't think the intent, or not the intent, I don't think that we're going to receive the full 1.3 back to the general yeah, fund. Yeah, uh, no question about it. Um, so, uh, the bulk of what has not been able to be uh, recouped from GDOT was for administrative costs. They're non-reimbursable. Uh, they never are, essentially. Um, so I do not anticipate that we would be successful beyond this. Now, the reimbursement that might be coming as it relates to the acquisition, that's, that's different. Uh, there is no question that as a result of having, uh, I think it was six point, close to 6.2 million dollar uh, additional 
funds put into the uh, We Road project that we are now <coughs> able to be reimbursed for any additional expense. Uh, we have, I believe we're down to three or so parcels that we haven't fully closed out through the condemnation process. So all of the 152 parcels uh, required for the project have been acquired in the sense that we have possession and we're able to move the project forward. However, some of them were done by way of condemnation and, and that process just lingers sometimes for years. So um, there are some parcels that still need to be finalized through the condemnation process. We anticipate that all of that expenditure would be reimbursable, uh, but that would be out of the right-of-way reimbursement agreement not related to this. Okay. Any questions from the board? Okay, so in essence, just to, in a nutshell, you said you don't expect any more reimbursement. Is that what you just basically share with me in a nice way? Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Set. So they get the general fund and you won't get reimbursed for that either. Okay. Um, Just Biden. to, because uh, I'm not on the um, finance committee, we're adding 565 back to the general fund mm -hmm. to reimburse us part of the 1.3 mm -hmm. that we took out. Mm -hmm. for the okay. So this is to our good at least. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it is. But still we have some deficit. Yeah. Did we think we were going to be in re reimburse 1.3? Did we ever think that we were going to be in reimburse the whole amount? Um, yeah, no. <laughs> uh, some of that uh, precedes me. Uh, perhaps at one point there was an expectation that we could get reimbursed. Uh, but it became uh, abundantly clear soon after I arrived that some of those costs are, are just not reimbursable. And, and that led to this uh, <coughs> to contend with the 1.3. So do we have uh, any kind of uh, conversation going on with GDOT for the widening of uh, New Road in the works that we might get reimbursed later on? Not, we certainly are in, in discussions with GDOT about the project. We've had meetings with them uh, and worked out the details moving forward um, on how to proceed to, to get the project to construction, but that's not going to deal with this uh, lingering mm -hmm. issue of mm -hmm. expenditures that were made. That we've that already paid. We've already paid and, and they were uh, not reimbursable when they were incurred. Uh, they were just put into the wrong category in, in the accounting process. Um, and so we're not going to be able to go back and, and get reimbursed for us. So the 800000 from GDOT, uh, only 565 was earmarked for the rent. The other was for other projects. It was for expenditures that were made into the fund that were reimbursable, and so GDOT takes their time in reimbursing us for any GDOT transportation expenditure. So that's where we reconciled the fund and said, okay, and that's attached to the document. You'll see the reconciliation of the money when the money came in, how it was applied, and that left the remaining for the, to go back to the general fund. Okay. And he did mention the three parcels, and that's included in the reconciliation as well. And according to this, the fair market value of those three parcels are like $205,000. And so we're thinking, or the note is made that for the files, portion that we'll be buying, file settlements um, are no, negotiations. According to Michelle, talked with Mahela about this. Mm -hmm. um, but at a minimum, the fair market value should be reimbursed, is what they're. Um. I, 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 I'm hesitant to use the, the term fair market value because that is what we deem and, and what we think it should be. 
the issue that we're dealing with is that they, the other side does not agree, and that's why this has been lingering for several years, or at least a couple of years. So at some point, what we uh, do is go back to GDOT and say, okay, fair market value, as was established initially, might have been, I'll pick a number, 100,000. Uh, we paid 100,000 into the court. They are uh, alleging that it's going to require 200,000. And after going back and forth, we have agreed that perhaps 150,000 is a reasonable settlement. And then if GDOT approves, then we would be reimbursed for the 150,000. So the original 100 plus another 50,000. So um, the, the extra 50,000, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tag it as fair market. It's just part of the process that you go through. Negotiations. Negotiations. Okay. okay, thank you. I get back to you. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate staff um, reconciliation of this one. Um, um, you know, the Lee Road project was, was seen as uh, a, a priority, um, obviously, in the prior administration and the current administration uh, at this time to finish that work. However, um, and I'm listening, we're, we're dancing around. These expenses should never, they should have never been done. We should have never condemned those properties. Go back to our retreat in 2016 when the prior director stated that the grant is no longer available for the road. Well, if you knew the grant had expired, why are you causing liability and incurrence of expenses to, give, to condemn property? Now, I get the game, you just want to and keep it going. Like everybody looking, just gonna push this thing on through. Right? It's, it's awareness. It's like it shouldn't have never happened. Right? It shouldn't have happened that way. Right? So now we're here we're on the backside trying to fix this and it's like it is what it is. It's a hit um, to, to our on our on this side of the ledger on something that it, it was just uh, absolutely it should have never been done that way. Um, now we had to spend an extra the amount of we spent what eleven million dollars just like the culvert, we have to spend so much more to correct something that we we, we, we should have, you could have done it the right way, right? And so here we are on the back side of that, so I, that's one of those things like, that, that's $11 million that could have went to other projects that we now, because of the inflation of costs and everything, you know, inflation of materials and talent and everything else, we're incurring to finish something that should have been done. So it was sort of, it was sort of a domino effect. It was just, so it was, you know, it was, Sloppy execution, you just, you know, word. It was sloppy execution, guys. We shouldn't have been in this place. We should not be taking hits like this. Uh, but they are what they are. But staff, thank you for reconciling that. It's okay to be truthful and transparent about what happened. Um, but we go forward. Um, I, I think we simply just go forward. Um, and, um, you know, as we, you know, uh, again, it's a little volatile in our financials when you have these, these moments, you're trying to get it smooth. We have this 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 historical lingering, but at, at some point we'll we'll get through this indigestion um, and this transition, and, and get to a place where we have better com command, better planning, better understanding of how this thing works. Um, because some of this this we should not have ever taken this type of hit, um, nor the aftermath to have such an expense to finish it. That's just it, it, it hurts, and I and I would disagree sometimes with my colleagues' comments. With yes, this is costly. It, it is what it is, but it's like it, it's not because it's costly. It's because of the execution in the past. So I just want to say that for the record. Um, you guys did a good job of trying to dance and not throw other people under the bus. I'll do it because, again, I, I think it's unfair to even for it to be perceived that some kind of way y'all missed this. Right? This was allowed. It was very aware. There's no way that this project should have went forward if you knew the grant was not there. Uh, and so I'll leave it at that. I get it. Thank you so much. I'll move on to tab number 12, authorization to accept rebate checks from Georgia Power Energy Efficiency uh, Program in the amount of $30,123.41 and amend the budget. <coughs> Director Worthington. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, Georgia Power is offering a rebate program for energy efficiency upgrades. And as you all are aware, we've been doing a lot of upgrades throughout the county. Uh, so we've been able to participate. Um, so far, 
Actually, the $30,123 is incorrect. I got one more check yesterday for an additional $777. So we've got $30,900.66, and that's the combination of six different checks. Um, these checks are the program set up to get a, a reimbursement on a per item basis. So like each light bulb we change, we get a particular value, and the values vary from 88 cents up to, I think the highest thing was $7, but because of the large number of items, we've ended up with a, a significant rebate. So um, the rebate will be Douglas County's only. It's not owed to Amoresco. Um, it's just kind of a, a bonus for us, so. Okay. Okay. Any questions, uh, Commissioner Ruppelson? No, I was just acknowledging him. Well done. You know, I was, that, that was a good thing. Well done. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, James. Thank you. All right, tab number 13, authorization to grant right of way easement to Greystone Tower to South Douglas Public Safety Radio Tower and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Oh, Hello. Deputy Chief yeah. Zachman. Uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners, this is just an easement for Greystone Tower to set permanent power for the last radio tower. And this one is in, in fair play off Highway 166. Okay, any questions for you? Sounds good. Sounds like this will be the this is the last tower. This is my favorite last one. Last this is it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That's one best one. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments from board commissioners before I ask our um, attorney if we need to call for a second session? Uh, attorney Thompson, do we need to go into executive session? Yes, Madam Chair. To discuss personnel matters. Okay. Thank you so much. Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second in the discussion. We have a motion and a second. Please indicate by raising your right hand. Okay. The motion carries. We will, uh, I'm not sure if lunch is here yet. Mm -hmm. It's not here yet, so we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll come back. And Okay, Board of Commissioners, we are back on air. Uh, any questions or concerns or anything that you want to do? I wish all of you all a happy Labor Day and uh, you. enjoy your weekend. And we will uh, reconvene on, I should have said, not, we will meet again on Tuesday for our regular Board of Commissioners meeting. All right. Uh, yeah, just real quick to your point, Madam Chair, uh, in the county, um, any activities that's occurring on Labor Day, um, during a Labor Day parade? There is a Labor Day parade. It's typically one. Usually, I'm not sure. I haven't heard the Shriners. Usually. The Shriners usually. Yeah, the Shriners usually. But I haven't heard anything about it. Uh, are yeah. they anybody aware? I don't know. I have participated in the poll. But that's something that we follow. Can yeah. we validate and make sure we get a mm -hmm. you know, special promotion out there for our Shriners and Labor Day and all that that represents, Madam Chair? Mm -hmm. That would be certainly an opportunity for us to push the 2020 census and expose it to the public as well. So I will follow with uh, Greg Martin, our communications director. But typically, we do have a uh, parade posted by the Shriners. Mm -hmm. Anything else for the board commissioners? Uh, no, nothing else to come before this body. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.